class 14 and our study on the Holy Spirit and His work and His ministry in our life. I want to take up where we left off in our last session. We were talking about the idea of putting off and putting on that came out of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 20 through 24. And one of the things that we saw in that is that those two verbs, put off and put on, are in the aorist middle tense. Uh, if you understand anything about various tenses in the Greek language, <clears throat> I think one of the things that you appreciate is that the aorist tense is something that took place in the past but has an impact on the present. That's sort of a simple way of understanding that particular tense. And it's a once and forever action. So, in reality, this putting off and putting on is something that happened at salvation. Uh, it's something that God actually did for us. And, and even though there is the practical side of it, and that was sort of where we ended, that what God wants us to do is to bring our practice into alignment with our position, it's still important for us to understand that it was a work of God. It was a unique work of God. Uh, it, you can't have salvation without, without this. Uh, salvation is a divine, it's a, it's a sovereign miracle that happens in a person's life. <clears throat> and individuals who are truly saved and born again, they do hear, they do believe, they do repent. Uh, that's what salvation is all about. They lay aside the old. They put on the new. In other words, salvation doesn't occur until that actually happens. And it has to be a work of God in which He helps uh, that individual to do those very things. Uh, faith is considered to be a gift from God. Repentance is considered to be a gift from God. And so what we are talking about here are inherent characteristics, characteristics that are inherent in the very work of salvation that the Holy Spirit uh, works into our life. And these elements and characteristics are always there. They're always there. They are inherent in what we would consider to be biblical salvation. And if these elements are not there, if this putting off and this putting on, if this newness of life uh, is not there, then in reality, I think that we would be safe to say that divine salvation has not taken place. Somebody may have made a decision. They have, may have come to a place in their life where they decided to do something and make some changes. But whether or not real conversion has taken place is quite another, is quite another story. So, once again, we're not talking about moral perfection here. Everybody's going to fail. We can look at a snapshot of their life and see that moment and understand that moment when they fail. But it, the idea is the motion picture. It's the overall direction of their life. It's the overall direction of their life, one in which they are putting off and putting on. And I think that there should be. That's what we define what theologians defined as progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification. If there is genuine salvation, then there will always be genuine evidence of that salvation in the believer's life. I've said it like this often. I'm sure I've said it maybe in this uh, particular study that real salvation makes a real difference in a person's life. In other words, if there is real salvation, there is real evidence to validate that there is real salvation. For instance, someone who's not truly born again is somebody that will ultimately not be very repentant. Uh, they, I've met plenty of people, talked to plenty of people about their salvation, and they were very regretful. Uh, they were very sorry, if you would, uh, they, they, they regretted the outcome of maybe the bad decisions that they had made in their life. Decisions that they, if they had it to do over again, they would have changed because they didn't like the consequences of the decision that they made. And, you know, it's, uh, I think we've mentioned it earlier that you never, you, the, the consequences very rarely, if ever, happen immediately. 
The consequences are down the road somewhere. So if we make a bad decision today, the impact of that may not happen until later. Le I, you know, we, you would have to quantify what later is, uh, a week later, a month later, a year later, a decade later. All of us have made bad decisions. And those decisions have had consequences uh, in our life, you know, whether good or, or whether bad. And so, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, th there will always be people that regret the fact that they made a bad decision, but they never repent. They never actually repent of those things. To the contrary, they are always resisting. They're always rejecting in some way the clear, understandable principles of God's Word. It's a, it's a very dangerous place for those of us who teach to make God's Word something that is is difficult. There are places in the scriptures that are difficult to understand. Uh, you know, I'm studying about Melchizedek, and it's not the kind of thing that someone just picks up and reads and understands all of it and about his superior priestly ministry. There was no priesthood at that time. There was no law. There was no nation. And yet he was a the priest of the Most High God. He was apparently a godly man, a godly king. Now, how, do, how that relates to the Aaronic priesthood, how that relates to Christ, is something that you have to work through. It's a very challenging theological section of Scripture. So not everything is just that clear to understand. But there are the basic fundamental principles of the Christian life are very, very clear. I, you know, there are times when God tells us to put off certain things well, those conducts that he wants us to put off are not, you know, fornication, adultery, you know, lasciviousness, whatever it may be. Th those are very easy things to understand. And what I am to put on is very easy to understand. So, people that uh, consistently re resist the Word of God and reject the Word of God, uh, they will always be defining, redefining the Word of God to suit their lifestyle, whatever that, that is. You know, I, I want to give you a principle, um, a principle that I think is very important, a, a, a principle that should help you in the long term to understand theology. Every pastor, every student ought to be a theologian. Uh, you know, every, not necessarily a professional theologian, but everybody ought to be studying God. Studying, you know, theology is the study of theos. It's the study, uh, I mean, of, of the logos. It's the study uh, of, of, of God himself. And so, um, we ought to be good theologians. But I, I want to give you a principle. I, I want to give you a very simple principle that should help you in the long term relative to understanding how bad theology develops. And the principle is very simple. It's that morality always dictates theology. Let me say that again. Morality, a person's morality, will dictate their theology. How they want to live. You know, men are consistently developing God, a God after their own image. They are, they are creating theology that allows them to live the way that they want to live. If you took something, say, like uh, homosexuality, uh, it, it's kind of a, a crazy idea uh, to have a gay church. I, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's insane, really to think that there's anything in the scripture that provides for that kind of thinking. It's the, it's the morality in a person's life that creates that kind of theology. And so, uh, the more immoral, the more ungodly someone is, uh, the more convoluted their theology is going to be. If you meet people that... Uh, you know, they, 
They don't mind having affairs. They don't mind running around on their wife they, uh, or their husband. They, uh, uh, I, I, went, uh, I went to a home one time, just kind of in shock, really, uh, of somebody that I knew to visit. And they're right out in a, in a, in a, um, uh, on a table, on, on a uh, coffee table out in the living room. Uh, they had some Playboys magazines, and I, and yet these people go to church, you know, they go to a kind of a conservative church, and and somehow uh, their mora their morality had dictated their theology, and it was convoluted, it was very very ungodly. So they are always twisting, they are always perverting, distorting the scripture so that they can be comfortable in their sin. They have to develop a, a theology that allows their morality to continue as they want it to. And so it, it winds up being a rejection of God's divine principles. And men make God into the image that they want him to be. It's a very, very dangerous dangerous place. The scriptures do not specifically define every known or possible sin. You know, that would almost just be impossible. All the different circumstances that we find ourselves in, that would just be practically impossible. So what the scriptures do and what the Holy Spirit has provided for us uh, in the Word of God is what we want to call governing principles. The scriptures provide governing principles, uh, overall kind of large governing principles to guide our life, and then it provides specific commands. So you have overall principles that maybe don't speak, uh, they speak generally, not specifically, to certain things, and then you have specific commands that are specific. They speak to and address specific areas of an individual's life that that believer is to live by. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to, uh, uh, this is the passage once again that dealt with the grieving of the Holy Spirit. But I, I want to read it one more time, beginning in verse 29. It says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So that's a command. That's a very specific command. Do, do not let corrupt a corrupt word. Uh, you, you know, we'd have to go back and define what the word corrupt is. But generally, uh, uh, something that is corrupt is dishonest. Uh, you know, if you think of corrupt politicians or you know, corrupt CEOs that steal money from people. Um, you know, they're dishonest. They're, they, they're not transparent. And so we don't, want, uh, we, we don't want to be speaking in such a way that we're giving someone a false impression of who we are, of how we live, of, uh, of our life, of those things. And then it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of of redemption and then it gives a list that all bitterness you know if, if you go back to um, Hebrews there is a passage there that talks about um, uh, in chapter 12 that if a root of bitterness springs up that it causes a great deal of trouble and and many people are become defiled through that bitterness so um, gives the illustration there of Esau and uh, how he sought after God's blessing you know and sought for repentance and couldn't find it and and they're just you know bitterness is something that defiles people uh, I I am I, um, I remember one time I, I had somebody in my church that they don't come anymore and and uh, there was somebody on our staffing that 
offended them. Um, uh, I, I think the person that was on the staff at the time um, made an improper judgment, and but for whatever uh, you know, it, they, uh, there was this a uh, kind of offensive. Um, this individual was offended by what was said, and next thing I know, he, he just walked out of the church one Sunday, just one Sunday morning before the church, just walked out and never been back, and and really became very bitter and angry about that. Uh, uh, the individual went over, uh, the staff person went over, sought forgiveness, uh, and they said, well, I'll, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. You know, it's, 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 let it go. Let it go. It just defiles people. You know people that have been bitter, and, and it, it, it affects every area of their life. People that, uh, you know, their marriages get damaged, they get divorced, and they carry the bitterness around about their partner forever and ever, and it impacts the children, and it impacts the grandparents, and it, it just, it, it's, it's so unworthy of, of the person of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is going to be constantly leading us away from those things. Here it says, just let it be put away from you. Gives a whole list here. Wrath, anger, clamor, you know, arguing about everything, evil, speaking, be put away from you with all malice. I have, a, I have this individual that I know that would often come to our home. Um, uh, it, actually, a, a, a family member that would, uh, you know, come to our home uh, during uh, holidays like uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter sometime, you know, we always have large meals and everybody comes. And it, it was, <clears throat> it's just unfortunate that you can't even carry on a conversation uh, <laughs> during a meal. You know, especially if it goes to politics, and you start talking, and the next thing you know, this individual is just making the biggest deal out of things that are just completely unimportant, and, and are completely disruptive to, to what's going on. I mean, we, we've got to the place where we don't, you know, I prefer for them not to come, because it's a very, uh, it's just not... Um, it's not edifying. Just let all of this clamoring just be put away. You know, don't be talking about people all the time in, in kind of a negative in, in kind of a negative way. And, and then it says to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So there's certain things that there there you know there's a there there are principles here and, and yet there's specific commands. And a lot of this deals with our tongue and how we talk to one another and forgiveness. You know, no wonder he can say, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you, because the forgiveness is what creates sort of the atmosphere, if you would, for us to not be bitter, for us not to be clamoring about every everything. So these are very clear and definitive instruction that the Holy Spirit wants each believer to accept and implement into their life so that Christ-likeness can be developed in them. You know, if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a bitter person, or an angry person, I'm clamoring, I'm just talking evil, you know, I'm, I, you know the, the Christ-likeness cannot be developed in my life. I, I cannot be considered to be Christ-like with all of those kind of attitudes and actions taking place in my life, there has to be a point in my life, a place where I make a decision. I know that I can't do everything on my own. That's not the point. The point is there has to be a decision-making process that allows that that puts the believer in a frame of mind. Uh, you know, there. I, 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 after I. Uh, uh, was diagnosed with cancer the second time uh, and went to Switzerland, I learned a great deal about my diet. Now, I've never been a big person. I've never been kind of out of shape. Um, uh, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a, uh, just out there 
you know, gorging, eating uh, hamburgers and french fries every meal, uh, eating ice cream every night. But I really came to a place uh, when I went to the Paracelsus Clinic where I realized that, that um, what I ate had a tremendous impact on, on my life physically. Uh, you know, they were very big that, it, it, you know, if you, if, if you eat a certain way that it's going to have a certain impact on, on your body. And so I had to make a decision. I had to come to a place in my life where I decided that I was going to eat in a healthy way. I wasn't going to be drinking Cokes and, you know, uh, just things that weren't good for me and eating candy and Snicker bars and all those kind of things. That I was going to eat in a way and, and drink things that were uh, good for me, green tea, uh, drink a lot of water, um, just eat healthy, a lot of vegetables. I, I, I've, I've, uh, I have a garden, I have an organic garden. I, I don't, I, I, I've got really great soils that I brought in, uh, you know. Uh, I, I eat, try to eat out of our garden, uh, fresh vegetables. Uh, and, um, and, and uh, you know, no pesticides, no insecticides on it. You can't, it's hard to go into a store and not get something that doesn't have processed food, but, uh, or a restaurant. But I just had to make a decision. You know, there just came a point where I had to make a decision. Am I going to live this way or am I going to live that way? And that, it, but it, it was the decision making, uh, it was that initial decision making that set the stage for being able to do what it was that I wanted to do. So, you know, these things that God wants to, to work into our life, they're very clear, they're very definitive instructions. God wants me to accept them and He wants me to implement them into my life so that Christ-likeness can be developed in me, but I, it's a mindset, it's, it's a, excuse me, it's a frame of mind, it's a frame of mind that I have to have relative to what it is God wants to do in my life, and I have to cooperate with that. So if we're not really that interested in being Christ-like in these different areas of our life, these principles will never impact our life. If we're really not serious about the things of God, then when we get to a passage of Scripture like this, what ultimately is going to take place is that we're just going to ignore it. And rather than Christ-likeness being developed in, in our life, we give ourselves to unchristlikeness, to not being like Christ. And the negative things take over, the bitterness, the anger, the clamor, the evil speaking, all those kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, if, if Christ-likeness if all of these things are an infringement on me personally, on, on my lifestyle, and if, if they are an encroachment on all of my personal goals, then I will either ignore what's being said or I will redefine. I will redefine the principles. I will actually redefine the Word of God in such a way that allows me to live the way that I want to live. The Holy Spirit is constantly, constantly working in our life to prevent us from doing that. I, I, I've said it often in this study that you have to stay in the box. You have to keep yourself in that box which is the Word of God. You cannot deviate outside of it and become creative and innovative and imaginative with the Word of God. There's no place for any of that. Uh, you, you may, you know, uh, we've tried to become so creative in ministry that we've, that we've in, in a sense, that we've removed the Holy Spirit's work from... Uh, we're, we're trying to be so culturally relevant that we've become biblically irrelevant. 
And it's a very it's a very important element that we have to appreciate and that we have to understand. The principles that are outlined here, they're clear, they're understandable to anybody that's a genuine believer. They are not complicated. There's nothing here that's difficult to understand. They're just simple principles that when implemented into a person's life, they create a greater level of Christ-likeness in them. And there cannot be Christ-likeness without these various elements. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 gives a warning relative to our accountability. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. To the non-Christian, notice what he says in Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, all the way through verse 9, it says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, self-seeking and disobedient to the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there shall be indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek or the Gentile. I, you know, those who are just simply do not obey the truth. They're not willing to give themselves to these, to these things. So God is going to hold everyone personally accountable and personally responsible for their choices. And if we resist, if we reject, if we redefine God's Word, invariably what will happen is that we will begin to influence others to think just like us. And unfortunately, many times, it's our children that we are influencing in the wrong direction. In other words, we not only justify and flaunt our sin before God, but we also bring other people into that sin and into that influence and into that, into that spiritual mindset, kind of an unscriptural mindset, with our unbelief. That is a very tragic and a very dangerous place for an individual to be in. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23, Paul tells us that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And the principle of having our mind renewed is a continuous action verb. It, 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 it speaks of a lifelong process. It's a continual work of God within the believer. It's something that the believer is continually doing. And the more that we think like Christ, this is simple, the more that we will live like Christ. The more of my life that I dedicate and commit to thinking like Christ, the more that I'm going to live like Christ, and the more Christ-like I'm going to become. So. That's why the Holy Spirit is constantly, constantly encouraging us and exhorting us to be good students of the Word of God so that we can think like Christ. If we think like Christ, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's the way that we are going to live. And if I don't think like Christ, then I'm not going to live like Christ. These are very, very simple principles here. By the same token, if, if we're not willing to accept the principles of God in our life, we simply will never grow 
into Christ likeness. We'll spend our entire life doing all of those things that we enjoyed, but things that never brought any glory to God whatsoever. In the end, all of those things, all of those things, where we have chosen to live our life the way that we want to live, we've ignored the Holy Spirit. We've ignored His prompting. We have ignored His instruction. We have ignored His reproof. We have ignored His correction. We simply have ignored His leading, the impulses that He provides in our life through His Word, where we just know that God is speaking to us in, in a particular way. In the end, all of those things will result in a total loss for my life. A total loss. They have absolutely zero eternal value. Let's end up Romans chapter 13, verse 12 through 14. It says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast, cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Just put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision provision for the flesh. These are clear, understandable commands that are given to us in Scripture. I I've said it before, I'll say it again, I am the one that has to live the Christian life. God is not going to live the Christian life for me. I have to live the Christian life and I have to do it in a purposeful way. There has to be some discipline. There has to be a, a, an attitude. There, there, there have to be some godly decisions that are a part of my life, that are part of the outworking of God in me. There have to be the same things in your life. And they cannot be diminished. They cannot be ignored. If we ignore them, if we're not yielded, to this work of the Holy Spirit that's taking place in our life, then in essence what's, what's happening is that rather than becoming Christ-like, we are diminishing the virtues of Christ-likeness in our life. Now, in teaching all of this, there's, there's something I think that needs to be avoided, and we just do not know how to avoid it. From a teaching perspective, it's just a spiritual dilemma that I personally, as a teacher, do not know how to actually resolve. Here is the problem. We don't want to just give a lot of principles, uh, when in reality we might not even possess a real desire for Christ-likeness. There, there has to be this desire for Christ-likeness. Uh, the issue with our spiritual culture is that it's always telling us that everything is okay. It, it's just a culture that, that, that just says, hey, everything's okay. Um, I, I remember when I was in, uh, when I go to Zimbabwe, they, they have a, a couple of sayings and they, they, they all say it. it it's just, it's, it's, I, it's kind of uncanny that they all uh, say this, but they say, it's all right, it's okay. You know, you may be late, it's all right, it's okay. And they say it that way. It's, it's, uh, and, and, and we live in a Christian culture that has sort of given the green light to people to live any way that they want to. It, it's, it's like, it's all right, it's okay. It's like, it's like going to a wedding ceremony. And then three years later, the couple being divorced. Uh, you, you, 
we all know people. Uh, you know, there was a, a time in, in my church uh, where, I, I don't know how many there are now, but there, I bet there were 50% of the people in our church had, had been divorced before. Uh, many of them before they came to Christ, uh, many of them before they began attending our church, but it was just like, it's, it's like, it's all right, it's okay. We've developed this spiritual mentality that in 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 uh, that almost seems to deplete us of a spiritual thirst and hunger for for the things of God, uh, the spiritual hunger and thirst for righteousness. I was uh, I was doing some uh, marriage counseling with uh, uh, a couple and. Um, they, uh, they uh, eventually separated. Uh, there was a lot going on without going into any details. And, and uh, they eventually separated, you know. And uh, the next thing I know, I find out that, you know, uh, one of the partners is they're going out to nightclubs. Now, I don't know what Christians do in nightclubs. I, I, I haven't figured that out yet. There's something that's kind of missing there to me. Um, you know, you're listening to worldly music, uh, you're doing all the dancing and the line dancing. And, and then the next thing I find out is that they're engaged in Christian mingle. Um, You know, they're still married. And yet they're talking on the internet and actually meeting somebody and having kind of a relationship, whatever that word means, with somebody because they have got some kind of official paper that has, you know, it's like, where is, where is God in all of this? Where is righteousness? Where is a hunger and a thirst for righteousness in in all of this, where are you going to draw? Where are you going to draw the line in the sand and says, "I'm going to live like a Christian"? Is it going to cost me something? Yes. It, is it going to sort of be counter to what I may want to do? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. The Word of God is going to be counter, not only to our own feelings and our fleshly desires, but to the culture in which we live, and even to the church culture in which we live. You see, genuine Christ-likeness is something that we have to really want and desire and pursue. Let me say it again. Christ-likeness is something that you have to really want. It's something that you have to really desire. It's something that you personally have to pursue. And if we do not really want it, then in all, all of the spiritual principles in the world, they won't have an impact on us personally at all. We read our Bible until we're blue in the face. We can come to church every time the doors are open, but if I don't really care about being Christ-like, if what I'm really interested in is living my life the way that I want to live it, making decisions based on what I think I need the most, um, somebody told me, uh, somebody that I, I knew was uh, living in, in uh, uh, adultery. I, they had already been divorced and, and uh, th this was the statement that they made uh, to me. They were living with somebody. Uh, they don't come to my church, but uh, they were living with somebody and they said, I, I just can't be alone. You know, they claim to be a Christian. And I'm, I'm thinking, what is it about Christianity that you don't understand yet? What is it about obedience to the Word of God that you personally do not understand? You see, what's happened is that their perspective, their paradigm of what the Christian life is, is very distorted. 
It's just, it's confused, it's, con it's convoluted because their morality is dictating their theology. And every week this individual goes to church. Every week they, they go to church. They take their kids with them to church. They take their live-in boyfriend with them to church. And nobody says a word. Nobody says a thing. Now, in my mind, the individuals are lost. You know, uh, the problem is, is that they claim to be a believer. That's the difficult area there. So, uh, you know, change is always rooted in desire. Always. Desire always creates direction. It, whatever somebody really wants to do, it creates a direction in their life. I really want to go to different places in the world and to evangelize in places where people are going to be responsive. And I have, it creates a direction for my life. If uh, you, you and your wife uh, or a husband uh, begin to talk about going on a vacation, man, I would really go like to take a cruise to Alaska or something. The next thing you know, that desire, man, I'd love to go to Alaska. Uh, the next thing you're going to do is find yourself on a boat going to Alaska at some time or planning for it. Because why? Because desire creates direction. So if you have no desire for Christ likeness, there's not going to be anything in your life creating that direction. There has to be a willingness. There has to be a desire. There has to be some something that is motivating us in that direction and, and and for me personally I'm just talking from a personal perspective there has to be a decision I have to come to a point in my life I say hey that's what I want and I'm not going I'm not going to do anything that's going to hinder me from reaching that goal you know uh, if, if, if what we want is personal satisfaction and that's probably what the majority Many Christians in this sort of soft biblical culture that we live, uh, if, if, if what we want is personal satisfaction, then everything we do and the choices that we make in our life will tend to lead us towards our personal satisfaction. I was doing a teaching recently uh, in our church on, uh, still doing it, on spiritual gifts. And uh, one of the things that I was talking about was false teachers. And over the years, I have uh, called out the false teachers by name, given what I consider to be uh, very definitive information about them, doctrinal positions, lifestyles. I mean, we got some of these guys out there that, uh, you know, they divorce their wives. Uh, I got some of these women that are teaching, uh, you know, walking around the stage. They look. I, 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 I have to be quiet. And and uh, they uh, they're involved. They're just wealthy beyond uh, just imagination. You know, they're flying around in jets, going to their homes in New. You know, their condominiums in New York and. I just, I, you know, one guy, he has two homes. Uh, one is about ten and a half million dollars, and I think the other is about twelve million dollars. That's not counting the beach homes, uh, beach home that they have. I, 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 that's, you know, and, and I made the comment, I mentioned one individual one night, and, and, and I could tell that there was somebody in the congregation that looked a little kind of disconcerted about all of that and they made the comment to me that this that they had listened to the individual and that they really enjoyed them and I, uh, I, I made a few comments and I, I said the problem that is very very clear is that <clears throat> and they asked me well what is the issue with this individual and my comment to them was that of all the all these false teachers that we find on the TV, that this one individual was what I considered to be the most the most dangerous. 
because they were winsome, had a great kind of personality, that they could be one of the, uh, you know, one of the, they could be a motivational speaker for anybody. I mean, they just had the, that articulation and a, a, a charisma about them. Uh, that, you know, they were laughable and, and amenable, and, and you just liked them when, when, you, when you saw them. I mean, they, they were kind of appealing to you. In fact, I, I had sat down and listened to this individual on a no, no, number of occasions, and I have to admit, I, I, I mean, I, I have to say, honestly and transparently, that, that it, was, it, it was interesting. You know, I, I found myself kind of being caught up in it, and but it didn't take long to appreciate and to understand that what was taking place was it was it was not they were not teaching and preaching a God-centered gospel. It was a man-centered gospel. It wasn't. It it was the idea of what can God do for me, you know. How can, how can I be the better me? How, how can I, how can I, um, uh, you know, what can God do for me? It's, it's, all, uh, it's all about man. It's all about man becoming better and happier and richer and, and uh, all of these kinds of things. It's a man-centered gospel. It's deadly. It, it removes the desire for Christ-likeness. It increases the desires of the flesh. And so this Christ-likeness is something that we, that we have to want. Uh, we will never... Um, I, we, these are just things that we have to desire in our life. Let me give you what I think the principle is here that I'm really trying to communicate. And you may say, well, what does all this have to do with the Holy Spirit? It has to do everything with the Holy Spirit. This is sanctification. This is His work. This is what He does. These are the areas that He illuminates. This is what He causes us to think about. This is what He works on. And if we're not conscious of that, then we're going to miss the greatest work that our personal life can be involved in. Is this work of sanctification. This changing me from being how I was to how Christ is. And so the issue here is, this is a very simple I issue, is that we will never change until we want to change. We will never change until we want to change. We will never become a follower of Christ until we want to be a follower of Christ. And so we will never submit our life to Christ until we want to submit our life to Christ. We will never become Christ-like until we deeply desire to be Christ-like. You know, I have, a, I have this desire. I, it's, maybe, a, maybe I'm talking about it a little bit too much, but it's a personal desire. I've been a Christian for nearly 43 years, and I, I still have this consuming desire that I want to be as Christ-like as I can. Everywhere I go, uh, people that I meet... Um, uh, how I, my demeanor, uh, my my beliefs, my, my convictions, um, all of these things. I want them. I want them. I desperately desire them to be something that reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. And and how do we not change and and not become a follower and not submit our life to Christ? It's simple. It's really very simple. We just, we just get up today from the study and leave. You know, the Christian just gets up from church and just leaves. Just get up from a class and, and leave. Uh, just get up, you know, in the morning, just go back your day and do, just live the way that you want to. Uh, you know, we do not even think about or consider these things until we bring them up again. You know, it's just like, Christ-likeness, oh, that was nice. Uh, I enjoyed him talking about that. That was enjoyable. Uh, that was something that was really nice. You know, and then we don't ever think about it again. 
And so we just go through the motions of Christianity. We go through the motions of religion. And honestly, we just ignore these things and we keep them at a very superficial level. And if we agree with it all and we support it all, we just never submit to it. We just never yield our life to it. That's the difference. There has to be a desire. There, we will never change until we want to change. And we will never want to change until we become, until we are confronted with the things that need to change. Um, it's, it's a critical element of the Christian life. So the principles here are really very simple. First, we have to understand what, from the scriptures, the things that are not Christ-like. And then we simply put them off. We lay them aside. God's not going to do that for me. God's not going to do that for you. It's something that you have to do. As you are in the way, as you are doing it, He will strengthen you. He will encourage you, but He's not going to do it for you. We're the ones that have to let go of things that are not Christ-like. And secondly, we have to understand from the Scripture what things are Christ-like, and then we have to put them on. So we have to understand what's not Christ-like, put it off. We have to understand what things are Christ-like, and put them on. Once again, that's not something that God's going to do for us. That's something that we have to embrace personally. God's not going to do it for us. So there they are, two simple principles. Put off, put on. And just saying those things probably does not have a great deal of impact on most believers. It's just way, way too simple. And we are much too familiar with these kinds of things. So we hear with our ears, but we really do not hear with our heart. So there are two passages of Scripture I think, which identify some of these spiritual issues and that need to take place in our life. And I want you to look at them with me for just a moment. The first is in Romans chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 11 through 13. It says, likewise, you also, I, I want to add some words in, 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 in this, and I'll emphasize it as, I, the word I want to emphasize is the word you. It's not, it's not actually in this, in, 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 in what we're going to read, but it's understood. It says, likewise, you also, you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore you do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust, and you do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but you present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So there's some negative things, you got to reckon yourself to be dead. you got to not let sin reign in your mortal body. You can't be presenting your members as members of unrighteousness. You have to present yourself to God. In Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 beginning with verse 5, it says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Then it gives us listing. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, and because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off, put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to to the image of him who created him. So once again, this put off, put on is an aorist tense verb that means that it happened in the past. It really happened at salvation. That's what made us a Christian. And I put all those off 
And I'm not to be involved in anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language and lying to one another because I've put off all of these things. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Listen, just bear with somebody, forgive them if you have a complaint. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I, I mean, these are things I, I'm to put on. I, I, I put on tender mercies. I, I, I just I put on kindness and long-suffering. I, I don't, I bear with people. I forgive people. Listen, I have to want to do this. I, there has to be a desire on my part. That's what I want. See, that's what the Holy Spirit is saying through all of this to us. I certainly may not be able to communicate it in a way that's motivational to you, but it's what the Holy Spirit is saying. These are the things that He is driving home to us in this particular study. We begin to become Christ like when we allow Christ to express his moral qualities and characteristics, his righteous qualities, his holiness, when we allow him to express all of that in our personal behavior. Let's say that let's say that somebody comes to you and they just they just bless you out. Uh, maybe you did something and 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 they just they just they, they just jump all over you for whatever reason. How are you going to respond to that? How are the moral qualities and characteristics of Christ? How he would have responded to that? You think he'd have just fought back? You think that he would? Do you think that he just would have sat there and got into a debate and an argument? you know, with somebody? I, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's what he would have done at all or to any degree whatsoever. Uh, I mean, what would Christ say in a situation like that? What would he want us to do? How would he want us to live? I, I think that uh, if the reproof was, was good, he'd want us to listen. If, if the reproof was inaccurate, that he just wouldn't want us to say a great deal. You can defend yourself, you know, uh, but it has to certainly be with a particular attitude, with a tone in our voice that reflects Christ. You know, it's, it's what I'm going to do right now. Can I write, hallowed be thy name, over, over this activity? Is it going to honor Christ? Will it bring glory to the person of Christ? And until we reach that place, where that's what our desire is. That's what we want to do. That's, that's the consuming desire. Will it honor Christ? Can I write, hallowed be your name over this area of my life? Uh, and until we reach that place where we desire that and desire for Christ to be expressed, expressed through our life, we simply will not be willing to address these questions in our life. The answer is always too demanding for the professing Christian. I mean these, the answer to that question is am I willing is no for somebody that's a professing Christian, for somebody that's, you know, for this make-believe believer, for this easy believism believer that has just made their way 
into the church. You know, it's just too restrictive. It's too demanding for the person that's uncommitted and indifferent. And this is not just something that you do. I mean, this is something that takes a supernatural strength. It, it takes a kind of uh, uh, a, a spiritual integrity and fortitude and, and courage and willingness that can only be developed in the believer's life through the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I just, I, I, I hope that at the end of the 16 different classes that we have, by the time that we get through with all of this, that if, if you don't leave with anything else, if, if you don't, if you're not impacted by anything else, that the one thing that you'll do is that somewhere, let's say in a, a prayer journal, or just a note that you put over your computer, uh, whatever it may be, that you write down, you, you put down on that computer, I mean on that place where you can see it. Maybe put it in your car, put it on your dashboard or something. A, a reminder that you want to be sensitive and aware of the Holy Spirit and His work and His leading and His guidance in your life because He is going to lead you every day into becoming more and more like Christ, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, leading you into Christ likeness. And so it's very, very important that we have that mentality, that we have that perspective, that we have that mindset. And for some people, this is way too demanding. This is way too consuming. This is too, far too intrusive into their personal life. You know, here, if I can put it in the form of a question, I think we would say it this way. What am I willing to give Christ so that He can be glorified in my life? What am I willing to give? What part of my life? Uh, how am I willing to live so that Christ can be glorified in me? Listen, I, I, I can promise you, just from personal experience, not, not that I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the example here. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the model. Christ is the model. You know, He's always the model. But I think just from personal experience, I can assure you that the more that you have that kind of attitude, what can I, you know, what part of my life, you know, what area of my life am I willing to change so that Christ can be more glorified in me and through me? Um, the more you have that kind of attitude, then the more that these qualities of Christ-likeness are going to be developed into your life. There has to be the awareness of these things. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, now let me just stop there before I read the rest of this. Gird up the loins of your mind. You, it's a mental adjustment here. It, it's spiritual in nature, but it requires a mental adjustment. It's, it's to be... It, it's to... Uh, it's not to be carnally minded, but to be spiritually minded. To set our mind on the things of the Spirit. Set my mind. Gird up the loins of my mind. Be sober about what God is calling me to do. As obedient children, in verse 14, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, will you also be holy in all of your conduct? You be holy. You make holy decisions. You make decisions that, that, that identify that you have separated yourself from 
uh, the things that are uh, inappropriate, the things that are not edifying, the things that are uh, that are going to tear you down, the things that are going to tear other people down. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So that's it. Gird up, do not conform, be holy. <laughs> Gird up, do not conform, be holy. Gird up, do not conform, be holy. Be just as holy in our conduct as Christ was holy in His conduct. That's the Christian life. It's having our life fully and completely controlled by God's Word and by God's Spirit. Every word, every deed, every motive, every day. Is it demanding? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the mindset. That's the mindset that I have to have. You know, it's like somebody, if I can use this, have you ever watched those Iron Man uh, things on TV? You know, they'll have it on ESPN or something. And they'll be out in California and they'll... They'll go out in the ocean and they'll swim for two and a half miles and then and then they'll do a, a bike run for 110 miles and then they'll run for 26 miles. They'll do a marathon. Do you know what kind of mindset a person has to have to do that? Uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, my son, used to work in uh, Australia. And so we had we had kind of made a commitment that that wherever our our kids lived and moved to, that we would always find a way to go and visit them in those places. And uh, uh, we kind of liked the fact that he went to Australia and and worked there because it gave us an opportunity to go to Australia. And so in uh, on, on our trip, we we stopped in on. Uh, we went to uh, Hawaii, and we stayed there for about three days, not a long vacation there. Uh, very nice. I was incredibly impressed with Pearl Harbor. It, it, was, it made an impact on me. Uh, it, was a, it was an amazing, amazing place. And, uh, but um, uh, while we were there, they were having, uh, they had all these people that were there. I mean, just thousands and thousands of people that were there because they were having one of these Iron Man uh, events that week or that or at the end of that week. And, you know, you have out people riding bikes. And, I mean, we got hundreds of contestants, thousands, I guess. And, they, they, you know, we're arriving in the airport and we got all these people coming and they got their bikes with them and, and everything. And we come to find out that they're having this... Listen, I, I don't know about you. It would be hard for me to walk 26 miles. Nevertheless, to run 26 miles after I've ridden a bike for 110 and swam out in the ocean for two and a half miles. You have to have a certain kind of mindset that allows you to do that. And I would say that if, if that's a demanding task that those individuals have, that this thing of girding up the loins of our mind, not conforming ourselves to uh, the former lust, and, and, and being holy as He is holy, that kind of mindset is just as demanding, more demanding in reality, from a spiritual perspective, as these people that are running in these Iron Man contests. You have to have the mindset. The Holy Spirit has to have your heart, he has to have your mind, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, that you have to think in a certain way so that he can work in a certain way. Uh, in, in our conscience, in, in our heart, and in our mind, I think we, we know what's right. I, I, I know, I do. I know what's right, I know what's wrong. I, I, I know, I've been a Christian long enough, I just know from the Word of God if I'm doing something that's the right thing to do or if I'm not doing the right thing. So it's simply a matter of whether or not we are willing to make the right choices and to take up our cross daily and to follow Christ. And if we are inclined to be disobedient, if we're inclined to be dishonoring, if we're inclined to be spiritually indifferent to God's Word and His call for holiness and righteousness in our life, if we're always willing to justify our lifestyle and to ignore His will for our life, 
then we would say for that person that salvation has never really taken place in their life. Now I know once again we've talked about it. I'm not going to address it again. Somebody's going to say, well, what about so and so? What about the exception? Don't base your theology on the exceptions. You let God take care of the exceptions. If there's somebody that completely ignores all of these things that we've just talked about and God saves them, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But in most cases, what they are doing is actually reflecting that there is not a work of God. That it's just a religious facade. Just think of all the people that were in Jesus' day. Uh, all the Pharisees and the Sadducees that he, he spoke against. He, 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 re, he exposed where they were uh, in their life. Uh, you know, that's a good thing. The exposure is a good thing. The last thing you want to do is, is to let somebody continue to live under the illusion that they're saved when in reality they are very lost. You know, these people that I'm describing here, they, they've never come to a place of genuine repentance and faith and commitment and they are eternally dangerous to spending eternity apart from Christ. What a tragedy. What a tragedy of the absolute greatest proportion. There will be nothing more tragic than for someone to come to the end of their life and find out that they have been completely and utterly wrong their entire life on everything that mattered. Now, how tragic is that? I mean, how tragic is that? Listen, you, if you are going to be in the ministry, you by default become God's spokesman. You become God's mouthpiece. You become the one that God speaks through. And if you don't have a mindset that's willing to address these kind of very simple issues in a, in a meaningful, purposeful, loving way with people, in a direct way, uh, uh, even in a confrontational way at times, then you probably need to reconsider. You, you probably re you need to reconsider if you are actually doing the right and proper thing. It, the worst thing. You know, I, I'm a, I, I know as a pastor that I am a, a, a huge... Uh, I'm a stickler for this, for this very thing. I, I don't want anybody in my church I don't want one single person. I do not pastor a large church. I wouldn't be good at a large church. I would. Nobody would like me. Um, uh, uh, they wouldn't like the message. That, that's not. I'm not trying to be self righteous here. But I'm not willing. I am just simply not willing to preach a soft gospel. I, I'm not willing to go outside of the box. Now, it's, it, there, there has to be evidence of salvation in a, in a, in a person's life. Why? why? Why did I say that? Why do I feel that strongly about it? Because I don't want to be guilty of giving them the illusion that they're saved when in reality there's nothing in their life to reflect that. And people just don't like to hear that. They want to come to church and you just soothe them and tell them that, hey, you, everything's okay, you're doing great. Uh, you know, you may not be the best Christian in the world, but, you know, God loves you and has forgiven you of your sins and all those kind of things. And then one day they, they die and they stand in eternity before God and find out that He doesn't let them into His kingdom. How tragic. Is that you can't you can't paint a worse scenario and so uh, there's just nothing that's going to be worse than for a person at the end of their life to find out that they have been utterly and completely wrong on the only thing that really mattered I, I can't imagine I, I personally I, I I've tried to imagine it at times um, I have loved ones that just simply are not saved. Um, they've had every opportunity. Uh, they're just, they're just resistant. 
And I cannot imagine what it would be like to stand before God um, on that day at the great white throne judgment of God. The dead are brought up. Um, they stand before God. The books, uh, the Lamb's book of life is opened and uh, their name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life. And an angel comes and casts them. I think that word there for cast in the Greek is ex balo. It has the idea of that they are just thrown. They're just, it's a, it's a strong. They're just thrown and cast into the lake of fire from which there is no escape. There's no escape. And all along, knowing that the life-changing truth of God was right there before them. You know, I don't, I don't want him to say, not that it will make any difference at that point, well, my pastor just never told me this. Yes, your pastor did tell you this. And he spoke very transparently and genuinely and sincerely and boldly and accurately to you about these things. Now, I want us to appreciate that the process of sanctification begins the very moment that someone is saved, and it continues for a lifetime. We've addressed this. It's a continual lifetime process. But the process begins at salvation and is often referred to as initial sanctification. Why? It's because at the moment of salvation, remember we've identified it as initial I'm identifying it here as uh, theologically as initial sanctification and progressive sanctification. So what is it that the term initial sanctification actually means? What, what are the theologians trying to say and communicate in that? Well, what it is, is that at the moment of salvation that God makes actual changes in the believer's life, in the new believer's life. There, there, there are some actual changes that take place. It's not, a, it's not a passive thing. It's a very active, at the moment of regeneration, at the moment uh, that, that, that God's faith is secured and salvation is granted, justification is granted unto that individual. There are very real changes that take place in that individual's life, and they are spiritual changes. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, very familiar verse, we all know it. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I would add at this point that the change is not just some kind of spiritual legal translation or declaration that takes place. It's not just a paper transfer of ideas here. It's not just, uh, you know, signing on the dotted line. Uh, obviously that happens, but conversion implies an actual spiritual change. We who were dead in sin are now alive in Christ. There used to be a hunger and a thirst for the flesh, and now there's a hunger and thirst for the things of God. And that changes who we are and what we want. Conversion changes us. When somebody is converted, when somebody is born again, when somebody is saved, it changes them. I like the I like I love the word conversion. Because what it says is that it's converting us. It converts us from spiritual deadness to spiritual life. I was spiritually dead. I had no ability, no capacity on my own. Uh, uh, to, to, to do the things of God, even to believe God. I grace your safe through faith, that, not of yourselves. It, it's a gift of God. I, I didn't even have the ability to believe apart from the grace of God. And now, God has given me this gift of faith, given me the gift of repentance, and it has converted me. It has changed me over from being one way and now I am different from what I used to be. 
And so I've been saying over and over that if there is no valid, meaningful, continual change that's taken place in a person's life, then there's been no salvation because that's what salvation is. Salvation is a life transforming change in an individual. It, it's a delusion. It is an absolute delusion. It is a fantasy on our part to think that there's been salvation without any actual change taking place in a person's life. So whatever you want to call it, it, it changes us. Salvation, being born again, conversion, it changes us. It's a deep, deep work of God that literally happens within us and it happens inside of us. Now, the major part of what we are discussing, though, does not evolve this thing called initial sanctification. It does not, we're not really concentrating on the initial work of salvation, but rather on the progressive work of salvation. The ongoing, continual work of God that's taking place in our life. Sanctification is the only doctrine in the order of salvation in which we have an active part to play. So there's God's part, there's our part, God reveals, we respond, that's the simple version of how sanctification actually works. God reveals His truth in His Word and we respond to that truth. We put off, we put on. Very distinct, distinct uh, activities that we are personally responsible to perform and without which Christ-likeness cannot occur. Without these things taking place, the putting off, the putting on, uh, uh, Christ-likeness simply cannot happen. So in other words, I cannot be Christ-like until I actually purge myself of these specific characteristics that, that have been identified in God's Word as harmful to the overall process of conforming us into the image of Christ. You know, if I'm always arguing, if I'm always argumentative uh, uh, about someone, I, I have a, a wonderful friend, uh, just a, a wonderful friend, and uh, bless his heart, he is the most argumentative person I have ever met in my life. If he has just the slightest disagreement with you on something, I mean just a minimal theological disagreement with you on something, before you know it, he'll be in your face about the difference and trying to convince you of his particular position. And, uh, you know, you can't just always be argumentative. You, you can't always be unkind in what you say to somebody. You can't always be bitter in your spirit or unforgiving. Or, will there be times when those things may happen? Absolutely. But not as a pattern. Not as a lifestyle. And, and because if those things are always happening, then Christ-likeness is unattainable. Christ-likeness is unattainable. Listen, that's the only thing we're talking about here. That's the only thing that we're talking about. And I'm saying it over and over in different ways. I'm teaching it kind of repeatedly. Is that Christ-likeness is the goal. If I don't know what the goal is, you know, uh, it's like the little boys on the football team. You know, the little peewee five, six-year-olds that are out there and they don't even know, they don't even know what the goal is. They, they don't even know where to run. You know, uh, you might see them sometimes and they're running backwards. You know, they just don't know where to go. You have to know what the goal is if you're ever going to reach the goal. And uh, so Christ-likeness involves two very distinct yet complementary parts. And the first part that we will address it's what I want to refer to as our consecration. Our consecration. It's that time in our life where we come to a point 
in our life where we are genuinely willing to commit ourselves fully to Christ no matter what the cost. You know, for some of you, that could have happened at salvation. Uh, hopefully it did happen at salvation. You, you just fully committed yourself to Christ. You've been following Christ. You've been growing in Christ. You've been becoming more and more Christ-like every day in your life. God bless you. I mean, may the Spirit of God just rest on you. May your life just be become more and more Christ-like. May you become one of the most useful uh, vessels in God's kingdom. God, God bless you. And I'm sure that that's happened for many of you. Hopefully for all of you. But it's, you know, for others, uh, you know, for other people, it may not actually have happened completely like that at that moment in their life. So there still has to come a place where we have to make a decision. Here's the way that Romans 12, 1 describes this consecration. It, it's a very simple, this is not some laid back, free, uh, you know, uh, easy, stress free exercise. This is, even though it's a very simple, it's a very demanding decision that we have to make in our life. Romans 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Consecration is simply becoming a living sac sacrifice. And I, trust me, there's absolutely nothing easy about this. There is absolutely not the first thing that is easy about this. It's simple, it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. And one of, in, in my understanding, there is the element of brokenness that has to take place in our life. It, in Mark chapter 14, verse 3, there's this beautiful story. There's this incredible story of the woman that had an alabaster box which she broke open and anointed Jesus with with this ointment. I, I want to read this to you. It's a very, very beautiful, challenging story here. It says, And being in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, she sat at the table. A woman came, having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head, poured it on the head of Christ. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Well, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. The flask simply held the perfume. But until it was broken, broken the fragrance could not be released. Until that flask was open, and in this case, broken, the perfume, the oil, the fragrance could not be released. And in John chapter 12, we have the story in verse 3 of Jesus going to the house of Lazarus at Passover. And Mary took the same kind of perfume and anointed Christ, and I want you to notice the effect of that anointing in the last sentence of this verse. It says, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. The house was filled with the fragrance of of the oil. Now, I don't want to be guilty of spiritualizing what happened in this verse, but I want us to understand that God wants there to be this spiritual fragrance about our life. He wants there to be this, this fragrance of Christ about our life. It's something about us that when people are around us and and when we're engaged in different activities that there is something about Christ that is just constantly being exuded out of our life. And that's the fragrance of Christ. 
I, I don't know how to explain what all this means in, in practical terms, but I want to give you an example of what this means to me and, and how I, I sort of learned this lesson many, many years ago. I mean, we're talking probably 30, 32 years ago at least. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I know what it is when I can sense it in, in somebody. And it's almost, almost breathtaking at times to be around somebody like this. In my life, I've really only met just a few individuals like this. One of the individuals that I met was a lady by the name of Marilyn Laszlo. Uh, this was one of the most unique things that has ever happened in my life. Uh, Marilyn Laszlo was a, a, she worked with Wycliffe Bible Translators and um, uh, she and her sister lived in Papua New Guinea for, I think it was actually 28 years. I actually went up to a place called JARS, it's called Jungle Aviation and Radio the, it's the transportation and communication wing of, of, uh, of uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators that's located right outside of Charlotte and it's where they build these planes and they train people, uh, they build radios and, and you know so that they can communicate and get these missionaries uh, that are doing the Bible translation into all these different areas of the world that impossible to be able to get into. So Marilyn and her sister go to Papua New Guinea. They are literally 500 miles from any civilization. They're 500 miles. They are 100 miles from the airstrip that was made for them to fly in to the villages that they were going to be ministering to. And so here are these two ladies. They go... They have to get on a, a canoe type thing, a boat, and they float down the river for a uh, hundred miles, a hundred miles in a, in a river. Uh, I mean, obviously they've got people taking them out there the first time and helping them with the equipment that they have. And she and her, her sister stay out there for 28 years translating the Bible. They've got to teach these people. These people don't have a written language. They've got to, you know, they just sit there and point at a tree and they say, well, it's, they give a word and then they point at something else and they write it down and they try to do all the, the linguistic things, uh, the guttural sounds, and, and then they've got to teach them the language so that they can read. I mean, this is an immense thing. They've dedicated their entire life. And she came to Jars one day and we went... We went up there, we didn't, uh, I'd seen a video uh, about her life and I just wanted to meet her and she actually had brought some of the natives from Papua New Guinea with her and they had been on, they had left New Guinea and gone to Los Angeles and Chicago and flown down to Jars and, and uh, just quite remarkable, these individuals. And we were in this uh, hangar and there must have been close to maybe 1,500, 2,000 people that were in this hangar that had all these tables and seats. And I'm sitting there, i got my three children, got my wife with me, and uh, I, it was the strangest thing ever happened to me in my life, I think. We're sitting there, and all of a sudden, we, we, she's supposed to come out in about 20 minutes. The program's going to start. And the next thing I know, we just begin to cry. We begin to weep. I look around it, and my wife's starting to weep. I, I, there was this, uh, my children, I, I had three children, and they, and they, they, they just begin to weep. And I, we look around the auditorium, and there are people everywhere, and they're weeping. It's quiet. It's, it's, it's kind of, I don't know what was going on. It's sort of a, I, I don't even know how to put it into my theology, 
And the Holy Spirit just sort of descended in that place. And when I first met Marilyn Laszlo, when she first came out, here's somebody that had dedicated their entire life. They had dedicated their entire life. Given up everything so they could go translate the Word of God. When she came out on the stage, I thought I was in the presence of Christ. It was this, uh, this fragrance of Christ was so, was so powerful and so strong in her life. I mean, her life was just breathtaking to me. It was just, and I, I think that what happened, everybody weeping, happened because of this woman's, how, her consecration to Christ. And, and, that, and that the Holy Spirit just was there. The Holy Spirit was there and He was ministering and working and, uh, in, in a supernatural way. It was sort of like the alabaster box had been broken. And the fragrance of Christ just permeated the whole place. It just, she just uh, uh, exuded and radiated and displayed the person of Christ. And that's what we're talking about here. It's when the very life of Christ is being released through our life to other people. And they know it and they recognize it and they sense it. I, I think this is a very real thing. This is not something that is just, uh, you know, something that, that, that really can never happen. 